Let's go ahead and get started. Really quick reminder, move the syllabus around ever so slightly. Today we will be oops, backing up, talking about adenovirus on Wednesday. Yes, I know what day of the week it is now as opposed to Friday when I didn't seem to. Uh, Wednesday we'll talk about pox viruses and vaccines and then single-stranded viruses that are infecting eukaryotes on Friday, and that will be George Kaysen, a uh, graduate student in my lab, and TA for some of you who are taking the lab. Uh, I will post an extra couple of readings for that, and uh, also RDHV, which is our new, or we should put this as a crucivirus, that we actually don't know what they infect yet, which should be interesting. Um, following Monday, of course, is Memorial Day, so there will not be lecture then virus of Archaea, and these are sort of the, after Memorial Day, these will be the weird viruses, or the most interesting viruses, depending on your point of view. Um, Archaeal viruses, retroviruses, some of the giant viruses, and virophages. Last time we talked about the polyoma and papilloma viruses. Um, polyoma, the tumor viruses are in quotes because they don't really cause tumors in most systems, and we'll see for the adenoviruses as well. They're usually not tumor viruses either. They have pretty unique structures, and I should have brought my 3D printed model today, but icosahedrally symmetric, but not quasi-equivalent because they have hexameric subunits as opposed to, sorry, panameric subunits as opposed to hexameric subunits, but all of exactly the same protein. Uh, early and late genes, this should be Again, very similar relative to lambda, um, divergent promoters regulated by DNA binding proteins sitting on top of promoters and shutting them down, as well as also stimulating them. And then the big sort of new stuff are these T antigens, the large, middle, and small T antigens, particularly the large T antigen, which is, I always like to say, is sort of the Swiss army knife of protein functions, because it basically does more or less everything. Regulates the cell cycle, regulates transcription, regulates replication, etc. The papillomaviruses are real tumor viruses. These cause cervical and anal cancers. Uh, again, however, the similarities at a molecular level with the polyomaviruses are extremely large. Again, similar kinds of structures with pentameric structures sitting in hexameric holes. Early and late transcription, although instead of being divergent transcription, these promoters just sit right on top of each other. And we'll see that's also true for the adenoviruses today. The big take home message here are really E6 and E7, and that's what makes these papillomaviruses tumor viruses. Um, they're the ones which are regulating RB, regulating P53, Etc. And we'll see, again, a very similar story today when we talk about the adenoviruses and how those are working. And right at the end, I very briefly mentioned the human papillomavirus vaccines, which are incredibly good. And any of you with kids should make sure that your kids get the HPV vaccine. Mine already have. And I just have signed up to get my MMR booster on Friday so that I will be, I know actually just got the results that I am resistant to measles. I have antibodies, but not for mumps, so I need to redo that one. Uh, so, oh, sorry, any questions on the polyoma and papillomas before we move on to adenos? Yeah, David. I just had one thinking about the, the late and early mm -hmm. ones. You had a question, and we were thinking in that in the mm -hmm. polyoma virus, the uh, late ones are structural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the whole, the whole sort of early versus late thing, yeah. <clears throat> and viruses all do them differently, and so the different families are going to do them differently. And exactly true. They're, you need more of the structural proteins than you need of the non-structural proteins, but there are different ways of getting those. <clears throat> and for the most part, um, certainly for those, <clears throat> excuse me, the bacterial viruses and such, there'll be some kind of differential regulation that leads to a lot more production of those particular ones. So. Um, that's, that'll be the case also for these polyomaviruses, for instance. Those late promoters are much stronger promoters uh, 
than the early promoters. So it's the transcriptional level that's being regulated. If you have something like the picoRNA viruses, <clears throat> there you just have one gene. And at that point, your one gene is, uh, you've got to get more of those structural proteins, and actually you end up with way too many non-structural proteins than you have of the structural proteins. And that's just the way that the viruses have dealt with that. So I would say that those are more the exception rather than the rule. Um, but it's really all about getting more of the structural versus the non-structural proteins. Um, and yeah, certainly for some of these, like for instance, the, let's see, uh, the filoviruses, the paramyxoviruses, for, um, et cetera, those will all have the structural genes right at the very beginning of their genomes because of this, the start-stop way that they're doing making messenger RNAs. So it's a regulation of messenger RNAs at that point. So I would say big picture, you know, early, late in terms of actual regulatory, you know, can, um, in terms of just the timings, but um, in terms of structural versus non-structural as well. Yeah, Greg. So why are HPV vaccines restricted to people who are over less than 20? Ah, because the reason, so the reason that HPV vaccines are for younger people is that it's assumed that pretty much everyone will have been exposed, and actually it's not just an assumption, it's a pretty, very, very, very good assumption, um, that everyone's been exposed beforehand. Um, at which case, then, the vaccines don't do you any good. Okay, other questions on these kinds of viruses. So I want to talk about adenoviruses. Um, we're sort of getting, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger as far as these viruses are concerned, the double-stranded DNA viruses. Talk about pox viruses on Wednesday. Those will be even bigger. Um, and so larger virions, larger genomes, more proteins. What happens is these start to get less and less dependent on cellular proteins and more and more independent, as it were. Um, so larger and more complicated. One thing that we talked about really briefly with these polyomaviruses is splicing, but adenoviruses are sort of the, you know, Experts in splicing be one way of putting it. They're ex they have extremely heavily spliced genomes, and in fact, that was where splicing was originally discovered, was in the study of these um, adenoviruses. And one of the other things that we haven't talked about yet, um, but will actually mostly be discussed on Friday by George, are what are called satellite viruses that come along with these um, adenoviruses, and we'll talk about those in, in just a second um, later on. Alternative splicing is sort of the, the key to thinking about adenoviruses. Um, and in fact, you know, this is splicing was originally discovered here. Uh, usually people think about splicing in terms of adenoviruses in terms of the late transcripts, and that is where the splicing was discovered. But it turns out that I think almost every, if not the vast majority of transcripts in adenoviruses are spliced, whereas for very few of the viruses we talked about before is that the case. Um, there's also alternative tailing that takes place. So alternative tailing is also what happens in the papillomaviruses. Um, you have alternative splicing that takes place in the polyomaviruses. Here you've got both. Um, cell cycle regulation is going to be very similar to what we've already talked about. Interactions with the RB, interactions with P53. A few things that are, however, different uh, with the polyoma and the papillomaviruses. These have small circular genomes that are packaged with nucleosomes. Adenoviruses are completely different. They have linear genomes, and their linear genomes have terminal proteins that are covalently attached to them. And it turns out that's critical for replication. And also the inverted terminal repeats, these structures present at the ends of the genomes, which are also absolutely critical for genome replication um, of these viruses. So as usual, I'll talk a little bit about where they're from. Adenoviruses are not terribly important as far as disease is concerned, so we're not going to spend too much time talking about that. Uh, the structures are absolutely gorgeous, and there are a few new ones which have been discovered in the last couple of years. I should say not discovered, but elucidated in the last few years. So we'll take a look at that. Uh, binding and entry is relatively straightforward, although these are now naked viruses. Um, bind to some receptors that are present on lots of different cells which makes them very useful for some of the things we'll talk about right at the end. 
Um, but the big deal here is transcription and replication. These are the things which are very different relative to the other viruses we talked about before. Release, as it turns out, is almost exactly like you have with bacteriophage. So naked viruses, how do they get outside the cell? They blast open the cell. And one of the things I was reading last night about this, apparently the birth size for some of these adenoviruses can be as high as 10,000. So you can get 10,000 virions out of one cell, which is pretty amazing. So where do they come from? Um, some respiratory diseases and eye diseases uh, originally isolated from adenoid tissue. Um, actually, the, the jury's out on you know, the common cold, um, whether some adenoviruses are associated with common cold or not. I'm a little sniffly today, so maybe it's an adenovirus, but uh, much more likely to be one of the picoRNA viruses. Uh, but yeah, some disease, but really not a big deal. We'll talk about sort of the major one right at the end. Uh, the m reason that a lot of us you know, talk about adenoviruses, they've turned out to be incredibly good tools. Um, again, as we've talked about for the polyomaviruses, SV40, love not we know about DNA replication, comes from the study of SV40 because it's easy to get lots of DNA um, that's bound with nucleosomes, so it's a really good model system. Um, in terms of adenovirus, also a really good way of getting lots of uniform DNA uh, with interesting transcription. And so a lot of transcription, in fact, some of the things you see in textbooks in terms of Tata boxes and various transcription factors associated with DNA in order to get transcription, a lot of that comes from the study of adenovirus, particularly the major late promoter. And then one thing which is happening much more recently is that it turns out that because these viruses do bind to lots of different cells, they have relatively large genomes, and we know a lot about them because we've been studying them for decades, um, being used for gene therapy. Um, another thing that's really important about gene therapy is that there are lots and lots of different ones, and probably everyone's been infected at some point by some adenovirus and probably has some kind of antibody reaction to it. Was an advantage or was a disadvantage as far as gene therapy is concerned? Um, we could probably discuss that in more detail, but everyone's been associated with adenovirus and they do seem to be very, very safe. And so lots and lots of studies have been done with using adenoviruses for various different processes and you don't seem to have any certainly not any major ill effects. Um, these can serve as tumor viruses, uh, but only in non-permissive cells, and only if you really tweak the system, or you make interesting mutations, which we'll talk about um, right towards the end of lecture today. It's not just gene therapy, but also what's so-called oncolytic viruses. So viruses that are being used to specifically kill cancer cells. Mentioned before, birth sizes of up to 10,000. That's really gonna trash any kind of cell that they get into. If you could make them to go into cancer cells specifically, this could be a really, really powerful technique in terms of cancer treatments. So what about the structure? Um, these are, as I mentioned, larger virions. Um, they've got lots and lots of proteins in the virion. Um, 11 at most counts, but sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less. Depends a little bit on how you purify them. Um, this is my 1 million times life-size version of adenovirus. Um, and this is the adeno-associated virus, the satellite virus that goes with it. So it gives you a bit of an idea of the different scales. Um, and this one is almost the right scale for my SSV. It's a little bit too big. Um, the Icosahedral symmetry here is a pseudo t equals 25. Um, let's see, who's up? David Ross, why are we saying pseudo? Um, because yeah, because there are lots of different proteins that are associated with it. And particularly in terms of the surface, we have hexon proteins and penton proteins. Hexons, a little hard to see here. It actually turns out that they are trimeric proteins, not hexameric proteins but they fit into the hexameric holes, so where you would have the hexagons on your soccer ball. Um, only as t equals 25, let me turn this guy on here. Um, you have to find a five-fold axis of symmetry. Let's find one up here. Here's a five-fold axis of symmetry. You have to get from this five-fold axis of symmetry to this five-fold axis of symmetry. How do you do that? 
you hop whoop, from one to the next. Yeah, it's hard to dry. One, two, three, four, five, and you get to the next penton, and so on and so forth. And that each of those you know, hops there is going to one of those hexons. So h is equal to five, k is equal to zero, gives you t equals 25. Um, pentons, again, this is where you have the five-fold axis of symmetry. Um, you have a base and a fiber. Um, fibers didn't print out on my 3D image here. But if you look here, you can see these short projections coming out at the five-fold axis of symmetry. Those are <clears throat> where, not surprisingly, you have interactions with the receptors whenever you have the virion associating with the cell. Um, and a little hard to see in this particular image, but yeah, base at the bottom, the fiber, and then a knob or sort of a projection at the very end. Down here is the hexon structure. Again, this is a trimeric structure. It has these two beta barrel structures, which are very similar to our kale viruses and bacterial viruses. And this is some of the evidence that people have used that these kinds of viral structures have been preserved over basically the, the history of life as we know it, probably billions of years. More recently, in fact, in our well, textbook, well, the more recent version was after this, but um, <clears throat> in 2010, um, Vijay Reddy at the Scripps Research Institute published this amazing X-ray crystal structure of the adenovirus. A little bit easier to see the pentons and the hexons here. Again, here are the pentons. One, two, three, four, five. Again, T equals 25. And then each of these hexons arranged in one of these triangular faces. Um, it's not completely quasi-equivalent, and that was actually one of the things that Vijay showed in this paper, that the hexons right around the penton are a little different than some of the other hexons. So quasi-equivalency is a good way to start, but as soon as you zoom in and look at more of the details, you see they're a little bit different. Another thing that was really clear in his structure is it's not just the pentons and the hexons, you also have these proteins in between the hexons. A little hard to see here, but in different colors, like this dark blue and the pink here, et cetera. And those are some of those extra proteins that are involved in holding the whole structure together. So we've got pentons, hexons, but also lots of other sort of glue proteins that are holding the whole thing together. Yeah? Echo. So the question is, is they're similar to a matrix protein? And Usually matrix proteins are going to be always involved with membranes, and these are naked, so there's no membrane that's associated there. So people just usually think about these as being you know, more of the structural proteins, part of that icosahedral symmetry. <clears throat> About the same time, and I think it actually may have been the same issue of science, there was a cryo-EM structure of one of these adenoviruses where you can see some of these extra proteins, a little bit more detail, actually, they kind of highlighted them here. Um, sort of like worms between each of these extra um, hexon proteins here and listed exactly what all of these proteins are. And because um, all of the cryo-AM people have a little bit of X-ray crystallography envy, they always show these uh, electron density maps to say, hey, look, um, our electron density is just as good as those X-ray crystallographers. Um, but I like this image particularly because the wireframe, which may be a little hard to see here, um, that's the data that you get from any of these structures. So the data is this electron density. And then what you do is you take the known protein sequence, so in this case, you know, tyrosine, asparagine, tyrosine, and fit those to the electron density. And then, when you're done fitting these to the electron density, you throw the electron density away, and then just look at these structures. So the, the real data here, again, is the electron density. And the structures are just models of what fits to that. And this is why you want to have a very high resolution structure, because the highest resolution structures mean that your model fits this extremely well. If you have a low resolution structure, there are lots of different models that can fit to your particular structure. So you don't know as well where any of these individual amino acids are. And if you're trying to, say, 
design some kind of oncolytic virus that's going to bind to one particular receptor, you don't want to know exactly where these side chains are. Um, even more recently, there was a yet higher resolution structure, again, from a cryo-electron micrograph reconstruction, where you can see more and more of these individual pieces. This particular one is actually one of those gene therapy um, adenoviruses, which they were trying to figure out in a little bit more detail. And this particular one um, has some movies associated with it, which we can take a look at here. Um, start with this one. This is the whole virion. Start this out. Let's see, I find these to be really incredible structures. But again, these, the, these three then, that's your trimeric hexon, and then the purple is going to be the individual proteins in the middle. This will be your penton right here with the base and the fiber with the knob at the very end of it. So you know, again, through these um, structures, you know, why do we care about the structures? Well, now we can really very clearly go in and actually modify some of these things so that they can do what we want them to, again, for gene therapy purposes, for oncolytic virus purposes, et cetera. And again, the electron microscopy people showing off that their structures um, are as good as the crystal structures are. Um, this is just one of those hexons that they've pulled out of the structure and analyzing where each of those pieces are. This again, the gray is the electron density and the red is where the polypeptide chain is here. It's a little hard to see, but that's where one of those beta barrels is. Here's where that second beta barrel is. And then these proteins in the middle that's what's involved in holding your trimeric protein together. Um, and just you know, rotating these around, you know, fun with computer graphics and looking at these different stages. So <clears throat> let's go back to here, um, partly because these are so aesthetically pleasing. Um, adenovirus is one of those that you often will see as, you know, pictures of viruses that people put places, um, also involved in art. This is at the Cold Spring Harbor Lab, which is where they have done a lot of the research on adenovirus, et cetera. They redid, of all things, their water treatment plant, um, but wanted to have some art associated with it. So they've got this, oh, pardon me. Um, sort of weather vane, as it were, at the top of one of their uh, nice viewpoints, again, right next to the water treatment plant, with adenovirus on top of it. Um, forget if I mentioned this in my molecular biology class last term. They have a really nice clock tower um, right in the middle of their campus. Um, but instead of on top of it, north, south, east, and west, what do you think it has? C, A, T, and G for the four directions, <laughs> again. Yeah, a place to really go and geek out. Um, they have great meetings there, uh, and uh, just on Long Island, just outside of <clears throat> New York City. Um, so a little bit easier to look at this. I do not expect you to remember any of the names on this structure. I can't remember any of them. The, one of the problems with many people working on adenovirus for many years is that they all come up with slightly different names for things, and then some people use one set of names, another set of people uses a different set of names. So the gene 2 protein is our hexon, and the gene 3 is the penton base. Um, but <clears throat> these are all those extra proteins. Again, we're not going to get into what all of them are named, um, but just stuck in between them. And then our genome, which is also bound now with a viral protein, a viral single-stranded DNA binding protein, actually viral just, uh, DNA binding protein as well as a single-stranded DNA binding. And then these X's, which are the terminal proteins, which are covalently linked to the end of the genome. So what does this genome look like? It's um, actually not that big, only about 30,000 base pairs. Um, and considering the size of the capsid, um, you could fit a lot more into this particular capsid structure. But probably partly because of these extra DNA binding, et cetera, um, it's um, relatively small. Um, linear double-stranded DNA genome, 
and has a terminal protein covalently attached at both of the five prime ends of the genome. And then there are these inverted terminal repeats. Um, so inverted terminal repeat is that you have on one strand um, C-A-T, C-A-T, C-A. You notice this is actually a typo from the textbook because on the other strand it also goes, you know, C-A-T, C-A-T-A-C. So that means that you take one sequence on one strand, got the identical sequence on the other strand. And what that means is, is that each end of one of these strands is now the inverse complement of what it started with. So it means that one strand can now loop around and bind back to the other end. And as we'll see, that's really critical in terms of how these genomes can replicate. Um, that's again the, the typo that I found in the textbook and I told them about this. Oops, what did I get to? Getting too far ahead of myself here. So questions about this before I ask you a question? And then we can grab there. Okay, no, no more questions? All ready to answer one? Okay. Move forward, get it to move forward. <clears throat> the primer for genome replication in adenoviruses is probably going to be most similar to the primer used for replication which of the following viruses. Go through this one and then go back and talk about it a little bit more. 5174, SARS, polio, Ebola, bacteriophage C7. So I haven't told you this per se, but should have a bit of an idea. It's based on the genome structure. Okay, there's one answer that nobody likes, but there are four answers that other people like. So why don't you tell your neighbors what you chose and why? confident enough. Just having some deep discussions in the back. So. See if anybody picks the one that no one picked the first time around. <laughs> oh, no, lambda is not an option. <laughs> Yeah. 
see, what do people think? Mostly, we're thinking polio. Why are people thinking polio? Why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, what what is that protein used for? Echo. I was thinking more of the um, the double mutant <coughs> side pair with the polio is used to complement the antigen at the end. Okay. So basically, you've got a complement at one end versus a complement at the other end. <coughs> so, what kind of genome do we have here? They not RNA. Nobody liked Ebola. <laughs> so it's a <clears throat> double-stranded DNA genome. So a DNA polymerase, right? It needs to replicate it. What do DNA polymerases need? Primers. Okay. So what primer was used in polio? VPG. So it's a protein primed replication. So the primer for replication here is also a protein prime replication. So this terminal protein is the primer that's used for replication, which is why you know, polio is the, the correct answer for this. Um, FIX174, cellular primase. SARS, um, which you really didn't talk about it, but it turns out that the polymerase itself, some of the enzymes can make the <coughs> primers there. Um, the same thing is true for Ebola, bacteriophage T7, has its own primase that it uses. Happy? No, not happy? OK, so protein primed replication. Just an alternative way of doing things. It'll give you the clicker question and see if you can come up with the answers for it. Uh, how do these get into cells? <clears throat> Again, the five-fold um, five axis of symmetry, penton, penton fiber, um, penton knob that interacts with the incredibly creatively named Coxsackian adenovirus receptor uh, because that's how it was originally discovered. And if I remember correctly, again, in doing my research, it's not even entirely clear what this receptor is normally involved in, um, but it's really good at binding to adenovirus. Um, the penton base also interacts with surface proteins, and those are integrin proteins. And we'll see on the next slide exactly what this looks like. So you have interactions with adenovirus at the cell surface, again, with these integrins and the coxaic adenovirus receptor. You have the receptor mediated into cytosis. The capsid comes inside. Remember, these are naked capsids. So somehow this needs to escape from the endosome. The escape from the endosome is actually through a viral protease that's activated at lower pHs, because that's what happens when you go into the endosome, the pH is lowered. And so that allows the slightly denuded particle, because it's lost actually the penton fibers and knobs, to get out into the cytoplasm, whereby it's transported along microtubules. Then it gets to the nuclear membrane, and then there's a second viral protease that breaks down some of those proteins in between the hexons, and then that allows the genome to be released inside the cell. And just reminder again, we're talking about these <coughs> different viruses, how they enter inside the cell. So SV40, these Kavili, um, we'll talk about the parvoviruses um, a little bit later on, et cetera, how all of them are getting inside the cell, influenza virus getting into the endosome. We talk about HIV, how that gets in as well. So nice review. A um, little bit of bl uh, blow up of the interactions here. Adenovirus, the knob, interacts with <clears throat> the receptor. The base interacts with these integrins. And together, this gives you receptor-mediated endocytosis, again, getting inside of the cell and eventually releasing that genome into the nucleus. So once you get the genome into the nucleus, now you get transcription. And so unlike the irises that we were talking about for you know, why polio virus um, has to have an iris, this is, again, it's a double-stranded DNA virus. So the first thing that has to happen is you have to have transcription, let alone um, anything that happens with 
translation. So transcription happens from eight different promoters that are present in the viral genome. Um, ridiculously overcomplicated here, but we'll break it down and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, lots of different poly A sites and lots of lots of splicing. Um, there are a few small RNAs which are made. Um, these are made by RNA polymerase 3, which is normally the one which is making tRNAs. Um, these small RNAs basically seem to serve as an anti-antiviral defense mechanism. Um, we talked about double-stranded RNAs being something which is sensed by the cell and turning down cellular processes, particularly translation. Um, but here, these uh, viruses come up with or evolved a way to try and deal with that, again, with these small RNAs. Um, but let's talk about the promoters. First sets of promoters are early promoters. And this is you know, classic, getting back to you know, David's question right at the beginning here, um, early being regulatory processes and replication of genome properties. So these early promoters, particularly these ones here, um, E1A and E1B, these are regulating the cell cycle. Why do we want to regulate the cell cycle? That's because normally cells aren't making DNA. They aren't in the process of turning on DNA synthesis, but if the DNA genome needs to be made, you need to have all of these DNA synthesis proteins. So these are the ones that are involved in the cell cycle. They then lead to production of these also early genes, but some people call these immediate early and early genes. These early genes are the ones which are involved in making DNA polymerases. And TP, which is the terminal protein, that's the primer which is being used for your replication. Um, DNA binding protein involved in replication. And then Finally, you actually have some of, of these genes, which turn out to be important for blasting open the cell a little bit later on. And this actually gets back to your question about, again, some of the early genes that you may need very late in the process. Um, these are some of those that are required for um, that final process. Then there's the <clears throat> these two short proteins. Um, not entirely clear what those are important for. And then the major late proteins. And so for the late proteins, this is actually just one promoter right here, which ends up producing all of these different genes. And as I forgot to mention, there are about 50 different proteins that actually get made from this 30 kb genome. So it's incredibly compact genome and lots and lots of proteins which are being made there. This has the classic kinds of proteins you'd expect, penton proteins, hexon proteins, fiber proteins, et cetera, but also all of those extra proteins that are fitting in on the inside just to make the rest of the structure. And we'll talk more about this tripartite leader sequence um, a little bit later on when we go through the process. And I mentioned these small RNAs as well. So immediate early, E1A and E1B, earlies, the E2s and E4s, and then late with these uh, major late promoter. So let's look at those in a little bit more detail. The major late promoter um, generates all of these RNAs which are going to be used for structural proteins, particularly things like the hexon protein. And so this hexon protein uh, as being made, you need that's the most, that's the major protein that you have in the viral capsid. So not surprisingly, it's the RNA which is most common in a virus-infected cell. So what a number of people did, um, particularly Rich Roberts at Cold Spring Harbor Lab, which is where they've got the finial on top of their water treatment plant and the clock tower that says CATNG, and Phil Sharp, who was at MIT, um, basically more or less simultaneously purified lots of hexon messenger RNA and then hybridized that messenger RNA to the virus genome. So lots of RNA, lots of DNA. And what they saw when they did this hybridization was that you had first at the three prime end, a piece that didn't match. So maybe we should back up a little bit here. So what we're looking for, it's a little hard to see here, are thick lines versus thin lines. So the thick line 
is where you have RNA and DNA together. And then the thin lines are just DNA. So if you hybridize your RNA to your DNA, you see this one thick line here, and then lots of thin lines. The first one is here, it's easy one to think about, at the three prime end of your hexon mRNA, there's a short piece that doesn't match the DNA. What's that? Short piece of RNA that doesn't match DNA. End of a messenger RNA. What's that going to be? Pi A tail, exactly. So there's no poly A tail anywhere in the DNA of the adenovirus genome, so it's going to be not bound. On the other hand, you've got this at the three prime end, you've got this, you know, long, I'm sorry, at the five prime end of your RNA, it stops here, and then you've got this long piece of DNA. Okay, that's not surprising, that's where your transcription starts. But then you have these very strange looping structures, C being the largest one, but B and A also being there, where you have an RNA sequence that's contiguous, but DNA sequences that aren't. And originally this was just seen in the electron microscope. So Rich Roberts and Phil Sharp were you know, looking in the microscope. Actually, it was other people in their lab who were looking in the microscopes. Um, and they saw these really strange structures, and then they tried to figure out what they meant. Part of that had to do with knowing exactly where in the genome each of these pieces were being made. So the DNA genome, and how does it correspond to the RNA? Um, one of the ways that that was done was through studying restriction endonucleases and doing lots of restriction endonuclease mapping. Because this was the days that DNA sequencing was just getting started. So a lot of restriction mapping. And so one of the things that was really important for this study was the discovery of restriction endonucleases. And in fact, Rich Roberts and his lab were so good at making restriction endonucleases that they founded New England BioLab, which was out on one of the major producers of restriction endonucleases. Um, because everyone was asking them for all of these restriction endonucleases, and they said, hey, we could actually start you know, selling some of these things. And so Rich Roberts um, started then, part of, co-founded this particular company. Uh, but in this process, you know, showing that you had discontiguous RNA versus DNA, you could see splicing. And this was then the, the major late promoter. First people thought it was just a viral thing, then people soon thereafter found out that it was a cellular thing as well, and then all of the different RNAs ended up splicing in slightly different ways, but they always had this, pardon me, um, tripartite leader sequence, you know, this piece that looped out the A loop and the B loop, which were between these three separate sequences. Why did you have this tripartite leader? Probably was important for getting good translation to take place and getting that RNA to be exported out of the nucleus. And again, these are the proteins that you want the most of. You know, getting back to your question, David, about you know, why do you have these late genes? You need a lot of these structural proteins. You want to make sure it's really well translated, getting it out of the nucleus. So that tripartite leader for all of those late genes are there. But now let's talk about the early proteins particularly the immediate early proteins. These are the ones which are regulating the cell cycle. Um, E1A in particular, E1A also gets spliced. Um, multiple different, actually four different splice products. But the important ones are these two. And again, unfortunately, they give you these strange names, 243R and 289R, or they give you um, 12S and 13S, because that's the sizes of their messenger RNA two different splice products V1A. I'm not going to ask you anything else about any of the rest of them. Now, there are a couple of important things about these. These guys interact with RB, our friend retinoblastoma protein, classic repressor of the cell cycle. Interact with RB, basically take it away from where it's normally going to be functioning. And then this one splice variant um, interacts with the Tata binding protein and another transcriptional regulator. So this particular one serves as a nice transcriptional activator. This one is actually just serving as a stimulator of the cell cycle. Um, these CRs in here, you know, CR1, CR2, this just stands for conserved region. 
um, because you line up all these sequences, you find out that these are particularly conserved. This CR2 is going to be important um, right towards the end um, of lecture, a little bit later on. But what do these do? Um, this should sound really familiar. Um, we have normally the RB protein, which binds to these E2 factors, which are transcriptional regulators. Um, E2, where does E2 factor actually come from? Any ideas? We just talked about E1 that's regulating this. So these E2 factors, which are critical cellular factors for the cell cycle, were originally discovered because they activate the E2 genes in adenovirus. So, yeah, now, really well known, you know, cellular regulatory proteins, why are they known? Because they activate these, you know, E2 genes that are present in adenoviruses. Normally in the cell cycle, you'll have cyclin-dependent kinases, which phosphorylate RB, that will allow the E2 factors to transcribe, and then when you have an adenovirus infection, E1A binds to RB, and these E2 factors can go and express these E2 genes. The other thing that E1A does is it binds to P53, which we've talked about before as well. Um, P53 is normally involved in shutting down the cell cycle and leading to apoptosis. What's curious is that E1A will block the activation of P53 and basically try and get rid of it um, so that it's not blocking the cell cycle anymore. So here, um, blocking the activation of P53 um, and leading it to being degraded. Now, <clears throat> Part of the problem with that is if you have this degradation of P53, often this is going to lead to apoptosis. And so that's one of the things that P53 normally does. So you actually need another protein to deal with P53 causing apoptosis. And so this is what E1B does. E1B shuts down apoptosis. So E1A, RB, and P53 normally would be leading to apoptosis, E1B shuts down apoptosis. So you need E1A and E1B um, for this process. But okay, once we turned on E2F again, because we've gotten rid of RB, that leads to expression of the E2 proteins. The important ones there are going to be our DNA replication proteins. So DNA replication proteins, let me get this out of the way, um, our genome has terminal protein and at both of the five prime ends. Now we express all of these E2 proteins. These E2 proteins have a couple of things. They've got a DNA polymerase, they've got the terminal protein. But what I haven't really talked about is a single-stranded DNA binding protein. And the single-stranded DNA binding protein, which is expressed from some of these E2 promoters, is such a good DNA binding protein that it actually serves as a helicase. So if you have this DNA binding protein around and double-stranded DNA, what it'll do is it'll peel off one of those strands of DNA. And that gives you <clears throat> a template. Your primer, which you already talked about, is your terminal protein, and you have a DNA polymerase. So the DNA polymerase will use the primer of the terminal protein, and now it has a template because this single-stranded DNA binding protein has gotten rid of that other strand, it will replicate its way down to the other end of the genome. And then, in theory, your single-stranded DNA binding protein could bind here. Then you'd make another copy of it as well. This process, however, isn't fast enough. And so the other thing that happens, and you remember our inverted terminal repeat sequences, which means that this sequence is complementary to that end. What that means is you can form these frying pan-like structures where the two ends so again, this is the five prime end, this is your three prime end, are right next to each other. But this piece is long enough <clears throat> that your DNA polymerase can bind to it and start to replicate the genome. And once it gets past this 100 base pair piece, now it's a single-stranded piece, it can be elongated as well. So you have elongation of our linear pieces, then they form frying pans, 
these can be elongated by the DNA polymerase, and you end up with lots and lots and lots of genomes. Happy with genome replication? So again, protein primed and the single-stranded DNA binding protein, which is basically serving as the helicase um, for these structures. So the last thing I wanted to talk about in terms of gene regulation is now this major late promoter. So we already talked about the splicing that takes place um, here with these tripartite leader sequences. And then transcription, again, happens from this <coughs> major late promoter. First ever in vitro transcription reaction was using this major late promoter and purified RNA polymerase. In fact, they showed RNA polymerase 1, 2, and 3. RNA polymerase 2 was the one that worked on this particular promoter. Uh, and <coughs> that will transcribe. As it's being transcribed, then you will have, because you always have co-transcriptional splicing and co-transcriptional tailing. And so what will happen is there are five different places that you can get cleavage by the so stimulate, I should say, by the CSTF and all of the tailing machinery and poly A tail formation. And then once you have these five different poly A tail formations, these are the five different places in the genome, then you have extra splicing that takes place inside each of these separate tailed RNAs. And that gives you all of the different RNAs, you know, L3 RNAs over here, L1 RNAs, et cetera. So it's the first tailing followed by splicing, which gives you the whole diversity of proteins that you have from the major late promoter. Um, and part of that's just because you have a ton of RNA because this major late promoter is a really, really good promoter, uh, has a perfect consensus Tata binding sequence, perfect consensus BRE, um, et cetera. So it, it ends up transcribing lots and lots of RNA, which is partly how they discovered splicing in the first place, was because you had lots of RNA that you could purify and look at. So we have all of our messenger RNA. We have all of our genomes. Those have been translated into proteins. How does it get out? Um, I love this name, the death protein. Um, I would just call this a lysis protein or maybe a holin if we we're talking about it from the point of view of a bacteriophage. Uh, this protein gets expressed actually from one of these early genes, and it just accumulates. It accumulates, in fact, a lot like some of the other holin lysis proteins that we've talked about before. So you just get more and more and more and more of it. Eventually, there's enough of it that causes the cell to burst. And hopefully, by that point, you've got enough of your virions that they can be released. And so it's this uh, protein that leads to that. The open reading frame 4, any 4 may also be involved. Turns on apoptosis. And so remember, we were shutting down apoptosis at the beginning with you know, E1B. But eventually, more and more of these proteins build up. And so apoptosis also is, seems to be involved in lysis of cells and getting them to be degraded. So it's a you know, breaking open of cells through assembly of these death proteins, but also an apoptotic process. And again, you can have up to 10,000 virions per cell. So it really kills them off um, extremely well. Again, it's to me somewhat surprising that this doesn't cause more disease, probably because our immune systems have had good ways to deal with it. Um, over long periods of time. So that's, this is as a standard case that we have with adenoviruses. But because we know so much about adenoviruses, people have decided we're going to try and use this for much better purposes, so the, the good viruses, as it were. Uh, so gene therapy and, in fact, vaccine production. Um, the reason that I'm actually not going to be here on the day of the final is I'm actually giving a talk at a vaccine meeting um, about why um, we have some of these particular vaccines and why they're so wonderful. Uh, the <clears throat> gene therapy forms of adenovirus are missing E1A and E2A, which means that they don't stimulate the cell cycle. But they can get this gene into lots of different cells because you have the Coxsackie and adenovirus receptor on lots of different cells, 
and these are really good at getting the DNA, which is inside the virion, to the nucleus. So this is what's used for most of these gene therapy studies. Again, lacking these proteins, which are stimulating the cell cycle, that's fine, but one of the things that you have there, of course, they're not stimulating the cell cycle. You're not going to be stimulating a replication of the viral genome. So you actually have to use very large amounts of virus in order to get the appropriate therapy because it's going to be one cell with one virus. Um, so that's why the safety issues with using these things, you know, very, very large amounts of adenovirus that don't actually seem to cause much in the way of disease, um, you have to have those large amounts because they can't replicate anymore. On the other hand, tumor therapy, which is where you now want to take the virus to kill a tumor cell. Now you want to have that virus replicating. These ones usually have a, either a deletion in E1B or a deletion in E1A in this CR2 sequence. So E1B, again, you know, that's what's blocking apoptosis. You want the cancer cell to die. If you can get that cancer cell to go through apoptosis, great, super. You want to turn that on, so one, don't turn it off. Um, turning off CR2, CR2 is interacting with RB. So that would be not stimulating the cell cycle. So that seems a little strange. Why would you get rid of um, turning on the cell cycle? Well, what is it about cancer cells? They're replicating all the time. They're always going through the cell cycle, and almost all cancer cells don't have RB in them. So what that means is if you have a virus that's lacking this RB interacting domain, if that virus gets into a cell that has active RB, nothing happens. It doesn't stimulate the cell cycle. It doesn't make more virus. However, if it gets into a cell which doesn't have RB, a cancer cell, then it can replicate and hopefully a blast open that cancer cell, cause it to undergo apoptosis, or make lots and lots of virus. So these are the sort of strategies which are being used, again, for gene therapy, get rid of these proteins that are going to lead to overexpression of the virus and stimulation of the cell cycle, tumor therapy, go after just those tumor cells and have ways of just regulating those two different kinds of tumor cells. So there's you know, a lot of research that's going on. I would say probably about half of the gene therapy trials that are happening at all right now are using adenovirus vectors. Um, and many of the oncolytic virus trials are also using um, adenovirus as a basis for that. And mostly because people have been working on it for decades. And so we understand really pretty well how these viruses work. And we've been exposed to them for such a long time that they don't seem to be toxic. Briefly wanted to talk about some of the other adenoviruses. I mentioned right at the beginning, no, usually not a big deal, not much in the way of disease. Uh, it turns out, however, there are a couple of adenoviruses that have caused all kinds of trouble um, in boot camps. So whenever you have large numbers of young people really close to each other, um, very often um, this used to be a huge problem in the US military, and I believe in other militaries as well. Um, adenoviruses were causing all kinds of disease in military recruits. Um, but they figured out that you can actually take adenovirus, which is normally, this is, this is a respiratory disease. But if you just give it orally to people, it gives you really nice immunity to the um, infection, which is happening, again, um, with the <clears throat> aerosol route. Um, so just add adenovirus 4 and adeno 7, um, get 162% oh, disease reduction, which is the number that I saw. Now, you get 100% reduction in something. I'm not quite sure how you get over 100% reduction, so I'm not entirely sure on all the details there. Uh, but it does extremely well. Basically, um, as long as you have a oral formulation for these, you can basically eliminate any of these adenovirus diseases, which um, as a military is a very important thing to be able to do. 
Okay, more questions on these kinds of things. Yeah, Melissa. Yeah, and so it turns out that these, um, the way that these work, the mucosal immunity, um, and I was going to talk about this, but I'm not going to. Um, it turns out that, that um, in the gut, you can get a nice immune response, but they can't actually replicate in the gut. Um, and that gives you a much better immune response than you would um, injection. Then there could be some issues with that, although actually most of the gene therapies are through injections. But getting a nice mucosal immune response to particularly adenoviruses, curiously enough, and why it's adenoviruses is not entirely clear, um, gives you really good mucosal immunity. In fact, this is what people are now using to develop new vaccines. Um, what they do is they take adenovirus and express um, whatever protein it is on the surface that you want to get a immune response to, and then just um, give it orally. They get a nice immune response to it. And these viruses are relatively stable in getting into um, so, yeah, normal, it would be an aer aerosol transmission, um, and that's what get, get, gets you sick, but um, just swallowing it seems to work really well to give you an immune response. Yeah, more empirical than anything else, but... Okay, why don't we just finish up with one last clicker question? Isn't that going to be wonderful? Um, partial deletion of which of the following proteins is used for oncolytic adenoviruses? E1A, E2A, E2B, E4, L1. And go ahead and discuss. I'll give you two minutes for this and then we can go. Anyone else still want to vote? Has everybody voted? Want to change your minds? Going once, going twice, gone. <laughs> it's 100%, so that's why I wanted to <laughs> stay there. Yay, woohoo. So on Wednesday, we'll talk about vaccinia and pox viruses. On Friday, we'll have a guest lecture. Um, so enjoy yourselves till then.